morning, welcome to Morning Matters. This morning we have made our way to the U.S. Embassy. Our guest this morning is Keith Gilgus. I hope I have it correct. Indeed. Uh, Shaijay, good morning and welcome. Thank you very much, Rhonda. Great to be on your show. Well, it's wonderful to have you on the show. Before we get into why you are here, we have some small things that we'd like to talk about. Sure. How have you been enjoying your stay? Oh, you know, uh, I, I, I say if, if you're not having fun in Belize, that's not Belize's fault. You know? No, <laughs> and, absolutely uh, not. And I'm having a fantastic time. It's actually interesting for me because I'm hitting my halfway mark. Yes. So I've been here a year and a half. I've got another year and a half to go, God willing. And, uh, uh, and I can't believe how quickly it's going. So, you know, I'm having a fantastic time. Belize is an amazing place to be, full of amazing people, so. Well, excellent. I will have you know that the people in Trinidad will be able to see you as well because this show airs in Trinidad and I know you did some time there. Indeed, indeed, and I had a fantastic time. From 2012 to 2015, I served in Trinidad and I have nothing but fond memories of my time there and the friends that I made who I'm still very close friends with. I am sure that every carnival, the people that run mass with you in Trinidad would say, you know who did mass with us? Well, guess what? It's almost carnival time again in Trinidad, and they're going to be getting ready for mass. Anything you want to say to them? I, you know, I played, I played two years in a row there. I, I, I played Jouvet. I had an amazing carnival. It was a fantastic experience. I have also played mass here yes. in Belize. I, I, missed, uh, I missed last year because uh, I had to attend a funeral. Um, back in the States, but um, but I had my costume and I was all set. I will absolutely be playing Carnival again uh, again this year uh, with, with one of the, not sure which one, but one of the bands I'll be playing with. And uh, so I look forward to it. But yeah, Carnival is one of the fantastic things about the Caribbean. And I love the fact it's different in each place. You know, Carnival here isn't like Carnival in Trinidad. No. One is not better than the other. No offense to all my friends in Trinidad, I think all the carnivals are amazing, or crop over in oh. Barbados or other places, so... The Trinidad so. will have your head for that. They, they, they will. They believe that they will. their carnival is the best carnival, so when I go there, I always have to say, yes, it's the best carnival. But Belize has a really sweet carnival as well. I, it is. I love it here. Um, how do you manage security on a day like that? <laughs> you know, I, I, I think I'm in a lucky position yes. that Belize is an amazing place, that... Uh, yeah, my, my folks uh, pay a little bit more attention on a day like that when I'm when I'm out in a crowded place. But uh, but you know, and we're not going to talk about the details of any of those no, no, things. No, no, no. I just thought about it. And I, thought, uh, you know, I, I am I am infinitely confident that I can be out there amongst all my Belizean friends and have an amazing day. Sharjah, sure, I think that that is one of the beauties of countries like these. You can go anywhere. I mean, I go, I see you out sometimes. I know, and then I see the Prime Minister just out by himself, seemingly unattended by any security, but that is the beauty of that. But nonetheless, mm -hmm. today we are here to talk about the Beyond the Horizon project. Mm -hmm. What is it and why is it important for the U.S. Embassy to be a part of something like that for this country? Sure. So Beyond the Horizon 2020 Belize is a really large exercise that we put on It'll start in May, it'll go through about August, and, and the focus of this is to bring in U.S. service members from, from the, the regular army, from the reservists, from the National Guard of Louisiana to come here and do projects. Now those projects include building four schools or refurbishing uh, at four school sites uh, around the Corazal area. We're looking at, at running a number of health clinics that on any given day might between be, be between 200 and 400 patients that they'll see. And the list of things that they will do, if you don't mind me reading sure. off this, includes general medicine, women's health, preventive medical education, dental care, optometry, immunizations, pharmacy services, pediatric and family care. There will even be a, a, surgical, uh, uh, a surgical effort that's made, and we estimate maybe about 60 people will receive a certain set of surgeries. And there's going to be a livestock veterinary clinic that's run as well to get immunizations and care out, uh, out, out to, to, to livestock. I'm not sure there might be uh, an effort to allow people to bring in their cats and dogs if they need to be spayed or neutered again. This thing is still in the planning stages. It has been planning for a long time. We're getting closer to having everything finalized, but we don't launch until May. Okay. The key thing is that I want people to know now that come May, you are going to see, on any given day, potentially 250 uh, Americans doing this type of work. That means big planes coming into the, the airport, that means helicopters flying overhead to move folks around, that means trucks carrying supplies. But all of that is to run the construction at the schools and to run the medical clinics. That's the basis of it. How are the projects chosen? So, 
All of these projects are, are directly in cooperation with the Belize Defense Force, the Ministry of National Security, with the Ministry of Health, with the Ministry of Education. So we work cooperatively with them to say, listen, these are the services we can provide. What would be useful and where does it make sense to do it? In the past, in 2017, when we did Beyond the Horizon, it was down south. Yeah. So the determination was made early on, okay, we've done that in the south. Let's not do it again there. Let, let's spread the opportunities around. So let's pick some sites up north. Now, they have to be somewhat contained because as we're moving folks around and moving supplies around and finding places for people to stay, uh, it makes sense that we, we do localize some things. But again, it'll be around Corazal, but not in Corazal town proper because oftentimes that's where services are available. So let's pick communities on the outskirts. Uh, communities around the area, and for the schools, it'll be San Pedro, San Antonio, Paraiso, and uh, and uh, oh, and I'm missing the I fourth was, I'm one. I'm so proud of you. You got those names easily and quickly. Chen Chen, that's the fourth one. I knew it was there. I knew it was. It was in my brain somewhere. So, uh, so those are the four communities. Again, why this is important is it not not just provides a benefit to the people in those communities, to the people of Belize, but it allows our service member the opportunity to exercise their skills in different locations. So part of this is so we can figure out how good are we at the logistics of bringing stuff in, you know, and saying, listen, road conditions can ver vary from here to there. What is it like to fly? Where can you land helicopters? All these skills are what our service members learn from this experience. And it's one thing if they just practice, you know, in a community in Florida or in Texas, but if you want to move those skills overseas so that you get different experiences, that's what we get out of it. And at the same time, we then provide those services to, to Belizeans. So we do these Beyond the Horizons. Uh, and Beyond the Horizon 2020 Belize is here. Um, but we run Beyond the Horizon exercises throughout the Caribbean. Each year, different countries will be chosen. And it's an opportunity for those service members to, to gain that experience. How do the people get chosen that will benefit? Or is that then just random people from the villages come out on those days and first come, first serve? That is where this is an interoperability project. So, so our folks need to learn how to work with the Ministry of Health because the ministry knows the people on the ground and can work with the village elders and can, can set all that up. You know, coming in from the outside, we don't necessarily bring that set of knowledge. And we want to show, hey, in order to make these projects work, it is absolutely in close cooperation with the Ministry of Health to choose the sites for the schools. That is absolutely in close cooperation with the Ministry of Education. And they will propose the sites and have, but they might propose, hey, here are six or seven sites. And we'll go in and say, okay, that one's a little too far away. Logistically is difficult. This one, we can't land a helicopter near. That one, we don't see the need is great. And so it's a back and forth, but we'll say, okay, of those sites, we think these are the ones we like. Now, we have folks on the ground coming and going to plan this stuff well in advance. We have these pre-deployment site survey teams and all these other acronyms that come in, but they go up there, meet again with the village, meet with the, the mayors, the municipal folks, have all that so nobody's surprised by any of it. At the same time, we also have to plan where are our folks going to be? Yeah. You know, where is their space to set up the tents? And oftentimes, in, in doing this, in setting up, you know, okay, they, they'll, the, the community will provide this field that will go in, okay, we're going to need to bring some gravel in to level that because the trucks are going to park here and we don't want it getting, you know, stuck or damaging the field. So we can often improve the facilities that we're using, and those are things that we leave behind. You know, the improvements to the school, obviously, but also the other things that we're able to do that benefit the community. And we're contracting for food. We're buying things in the local economy, and we estimate at least a million dollars will come in and get, um, get moved around in terms of the things that we're buying and the people we're flying in. So this is also an economic benefit for the communities, particularly around the Corozal area. How did you choose that area of the country? That was, again, in cooperation with the government. We said, let's go north. So okay. where does it make sense? Somewhere up north, where are there communities that are in need? Where can we operate? in environments that are different from what we're used to. You know, I sort of say, we can be practicing in Florida, and then if you forget to bring something, you run down to the Home Depot. Well, we want our, first, our, our service members to learn that you may not have a Home Depot around the corner when you're operating in some other part of the world. That's the kind of experience that they gain. And I, I you know, I'll refer to it sort of the first time you go camping. Do you ever go camping? Yes. I love camping. The first time you go camping, 
uh, you bring a whole bunch of stuff you don't need. Carry all this stuff around and you think, boy, I brought more t-shirts than I needed. I can wear the same t-shirt, but I didn't bring nearly enough food. All that sort of stuff. You learn by doing. Yes. That's exactly what these folks, they need to learn by doing as well. So what are we bringing in? Hey, did the planners get it right? So that this is the amount of food that we needed to provide and needed to have each day. This is the right medical supplies to be able to run a large-scale medical clinic like the one we'll be running. And we're going to be moving them around, as I said, to different communities. So it's an opportunity for your people to strengthen their skill, and then it's also an opportunity for our people to benefit from their skills in action. That is I think exactly it's a win-win right. all the way around. That when is, does it start? It starts in May. So, well, in many ways it's already started in True. terms of, of the cooperation and the interoperability uh, that we've been doing. We will formally launch it with some sort, some sort of ceremony in, in May, and that's when I get to walk out and, and cut a ribbon or the equivalent. And so that's the, the symbolic launch of the program. Over the course of June and July, we'll then be saying, okay, that construction project is happening, then it's this construction project, this team is coming in to do that school, that team rotates out a few, you know, a week or two later, this team comes in so they get experience doing it, um, and then we'll be running the medical clinics two or three days in this town, move it to another place, run two or three days there. So, um, so yeah, so it's, it's, it's a win-win for the communities. We get to not just practice the logistical movement, but actually providing the services to the communities. You say over that time you have more than maybe around a thousand people coming and going in terms of assisting. Do you have any idea what or how many people they might be able to touch during that time? So we're looking at about 8,000, around 8,000 patients will be treated in one way or another. You know, whether that's the optometry, whether that's dental, that doesn't include the livestock or the cats and dogs. That doesn't count. But that, that just <laughs> humans, we're looking at around 8,000. Again, this isn't going to happen for a little while yet. So there are still refinements that will be made, confirmations of the sites, because we, we've got the four sites that we think we'll be using for the health clinics. But again, that needs to be confirmed uh, uh, as, as we go forward. I just wanted to make sure folks know in advance when they see a whole bunch of U.S. service members on the ground, they are there for health purposes. They are there to construct schools. Uh, I don't want anybody to be surprised. Well, definitely they are not going to be surprised. They would have known well in advance and hopefully they don't forget. Hopefully when they see the people, they are, const they are reminded that, ah, this is exactly what it looks like, what he was talking about exactly. earlier. Um, I know we are low on time, so we are winding down, but before we go, um, I think in the beginning I asked you what what was the importance for your people, but what is the importance for you as Chargé in this country when the U.S. government uh, brings in an event like this? Sure. You know, there's an awful lot that we partner on here. And there's, uh, in fact, uh, we've started offering uh, to give a briefing to some senior level government officials and other folks about the full range of everything that we work on. Um, and so I'll go out and say, okay, we've launched the prison to court video link with the judiciary, or we've given out CARSI grants, and so I pop up here and there. Um, but a lot of folks don't realize the full range of what we do. This is an opportunity to say, look at the level of partnership. And that's what this is. Look at what um, we're willing to bring to the table to work with Belize, because Belize is such a great friend and partner of the U.S. And so, so that's largely what it is. You know, I want folks to know that we're doing this because we're friends. You're in the middle of your term. I'm sure that when you came here, you had uh, plans, what you're going to accomplish, how you're going to do it. How are you doing in your mind? I think so far, so good. You know, uh, but each time you say, okay, well, we got that done. That was terrific. We accomplished that. What's next? And that is what my exact question. What more can we do? What, what should we expect from you within the next year and a half? Well, you know, one of the, one of the great things we, we just learned about um, that the Belize government is doing is replacing the radar at the airport. Now, the current radar just just pings off transponders. So if a plane's coming in and it says, okay, my transponder's on, the radar picks it up. The new radar that the government of Belize will be putting in uh, just pings off the metal in the air. So if you're a drug plane, if you just turned off your transponder, you're invisible to radar. The new radar that's coming in isn't going to let them do that. Everybody in Belize wants to know when it's going to be up. And, and who will be monitoring it? It is, it is you know, it is such great news. Yes. Um, uh, I'm confident that, that having that resource on the ground will suddenly enable the folks at the, at the JIOC, at the Joint Intelligence Operations Center here, 
to start getting that information. Now that alone won't necessarily stop playing, but everything we can do working together to combat those sorts of transnational criminal organizations is a good thing. Listen, they're smart, they're sophisticated, they're networked, they're innovative. If we want to be able to combat them, we need to do all those things as well, but we need to do them even better. Shoji, I say thank you. Thank you very much for having me on, Rhonda. Thank you. Guys, we're going to go to a break and be back.